whenever I think about wheat management, I go to this conceptual framework that came out of the intensive wheat management program of the back in the 80s and 90s. And more or less what it does is it breaks down management into yield building factors and yield protection factors. I just want to go through these really quick just as an initial starting point. You've got your, your yield building factors of genetics, variety selection, uh, fertility management, stand establishment. And then your yield protection factors, weed control, <clears throat> insect management, disease control, and harvest management. Now, in organic cropping systems, we've got some unique challenges. And these, these, we talked about some of these today. We've got the limited sources for organic, uh, certified organic seed. We've got few yield protection. <coughs> Uh, products, uh, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides. So those kind of things we have to manage up front. And, and we'll talk about some of those. And then when we talk about soil fertility and nutrient management, I think the biggest challenge here is, is nitrogen insufficiency. The, the reason is it's really tough to get good synchrony between nitrogen release or nitrogen availability and nitrogen demand. And that's what I'm going to focus on the talk today. So. What's our knowledge base? And I mean, I, I knew this before I could talk, put this talk together, but you know, over the, the last week or 10 days that I was pulling all this stuff together, I was reminded that we're, we've got a really limited amount of, of knowledge on, on organic reproduction in the Mid-Atlantic and Southeast. We just haven't done that much work on it. Um, but there's been an enormous amount of work done over the last 20 plus years <coughs> looking at, at reproduction of conventional systems. And a lot of really good work. And I think that a lot of that information is either directly or indirectly relevant to organic cropping systems. And I'm going to try and convince you to that in the next 20 minutes or so. And of course still, I mean, you know, we need to uh, <coughs> justify the, uh, the existence of, of you know, our positions and what we do every day. There's still some big knowledge gaps. We've got a lot of work to but I think we're, we're, we're not as bad as, uh, as you might think when you go to the literature. So I think it's important to keep in mind that in order to have efficient nitrogen management, we've got to match the, the nitrogen availability with the nitrogen needs. And if we look at wheat, this figure for, for nitrogen uptake through the season from planting through harvest, you know, from planting to about growth stage 25, which is you know, just at the, uh, the end of winter, the end of a, uh, just at the green up in the spring, just as it breaks dormancy, we've only taken up about 10, 15 percent of our, our total nitrogen needs for the, for the wheat plant. So we don't hit our, our exponential growth curve until we hit about growth, start, growth stage 30. Between growth stage 30 and harvest, we've taken up you know, 85 to 90 percent of our total nitrogen. And that's why. You know, the general recommendation is to split our, our fertility applications to try and time it with when the plant needs it. Now, the standard practice for organic reproduction, organic corn production, most everything is, is to put all your amendments down at the agency or flat out in the room or whatever your nitrogen source is. And it creates all sorts of potential problems. Um, for one, it can be you know, excessive nitrogen in the fall or in the winter, increases your intensity disease pressure and also increase the extent of freeze damage. And of course, in terms of uh, you know, nutrient management, all of my nitrogen is much more susceptible to leaching and denitrification. So, to illustrate that, I think the, the best way to conceptualize that is if we look at the hydrologic cycle and how it relates to, to nitrogen management. This data is collected from the, the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland, but I think it's relevant here. Where precipitation is pretty much uniformly distributed throughout the year. We look at evapotranspiration, the sum of evaporation from the soil plus transpiration, essentially nil through the winter months and as the days begin to get longer it starts to warm up, increases, peaks out around the summer solstice and then falls off into the fall. Now, if we look at the, the balance of those two, we can calculate the soil water budget, which for a uh, this is for a fine loamy soil that's got a maximum water volume capacity of about 10 inches. That's all the water is a hole. We see that once evapotranspiration exceeds 
the easiest way to do this is point on the seeds of precipitation. You see that soil water starts to get drawn down. It continues to get drawn down until evapotranspiration falls below precipitation again, and then you start to build it up and recharge. Now, the important thing to look at here when we talk about nitrogen management is drainage. You know, all that precipitation that falls in excess of evapotranspiration when your soil is fully saturated needs to drain it. So any nitrate that you got in the soil solution at that time goes down the drain tile or, or falls out the bottom of the groundwater and has a negative impact on the environment and costs money. So we want to try and manage around this, this leaky season you know, through, the, through the winter months and the early spring. Now the, the general recommendations, and this has been you know, adopted and developed by Virginia Tech and then moved on to Maryland and, and more recently uh, adopted and updated in North Carolina, is to, to split our fall like, or to split our nitrogen applications between a fall application, growth stage 25, it's right at green up, growth stage 30, just as the wheat begins to join the spring. Right in here. So in the fall, there's oftentimes, particularly in organic systems, we've got sufficient residual nitrogen in the soil, particularly where we're following a legume such as soybean or a, a corn crop that was over fertilized or maybe you know, can't grow under dry conditions. Where nitrogen is needed, we don't need much, only about 15 to 30 pounds in order to promote tillery. I don't want to undersell this. It's really important to promote that fall tillery. So it's fall tillers that make most of our yield. You know, one tiller, one tenth wheat. And what folks have found is that those fall form tillers produce a lot more wheat than the, the spring form tillers. So they're important. I don't want to under, under uh... So growth stage 25 is the next time we start looking at a, a nitrogen application. This figure actually came out of Virginia. This, uh, this may be a little bit closer to late, late January, early February, North Carolina. Uh, this is our last opportunity to promote tillers. So we go into a field, we've got low tiller numbers. It's time to get on moving the night. And that, that rate is certainly based on looking at tiller densities, actually getting down your hands and knees and count the number of tillers there, calculating per square foot, coming up with recommendations. And the growth stage 30, late February, early March, North Carolina. This is going to be our most critical nitrogen application. This is the yield, the yield maker. Um, and this one's based on the the Virginia method is just based on a nitrogen concentration, but North Carolina, they recently updated that it's based on both the nitrogen concentration and the amount of biomass. I'll go through the, the specifics of that when we move specifically on to organic management. So these recommendations come out of the <clears throat> NC State Small Grain Production Guide. If, uh, if you've not taken a look at this, I highly recommend it. You can find it on the web and download it for free. Um, at growth stage 25, go out and take your filler counts. And sometimes it's simply taking the yard stick out, drop it next to the row, get down your hands and knees, and, and pulling those wheat plants apart and counting how many stems you've got. The, the cutoff is generally, you know, you consider it a tiller if it's got three or more leaves. What you're looking for is the tillers that were formed last fall and through the winter. This is sort of the, the foundation for yield. Where we've got low tillers, less than 30 per square foot, we recommend applying 50 to 70 pounds of bed. Between 30 and 50, a little bit less in, and once you get above 50 tillers per square foot, attack them. You don't need to apply a lunch and make a bottle of which you got. Um, just as a point of reference, these two images, this is uh, somewhere between 30 and 50 tillers per square foot. This is uh, in excess of 100 tillers per square foot. And in my experience working with uh, organic wheat production, this is much more common in an organic system than this is, particularly in a field where we've got a long history of manure use where it's been organic for a while and we've built up soil organic matter and uh, the pool mineralizing the soil much. But in most cases in organic systems, I think the, the growth stage 25 is definitely a, a, a place to evaluate it, but I don't think you're going to see any situations where you need to or not different. This is with the average seeding rate and everything. I mean, you're adjusting seeding rate for all kinds of things. So the question was, is this, this is uh, for average seeding rate. You can actually, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, part of that, that that yield building framework, you've got to establish a stand. That's, that's assuming you've got a, a, an optimum stand. You can make up for some of that if you didn't get good, good uh, establishment, poor seed quality, you know, just, just poor germination, you can make up for some of that at this point. But you're never going to get back up to where you should have been. All 
Uh, so then at growth stage 30, this is uh, our most robust measure of nitrogen uh, use. And these recommendations were just recently updated in uh, North Carolina, came out of a lot of really good work. And I mean, I think they've, they've really moved this whole thing ahead a lot. What they recommend is you go out and take biomass from three foot a row, bag it, send that into the lab, and they determine the dry biomass. And then score that as either a low, medium, or high biomass, depending on the weight and your row spacing. So low, medium, or high biomass. And they determine the nitrogen concentration. Now, if you've got a, a high biomass of 3.5% nitrogen, you don't need to apply any nitrogen at that time. But if you've got a, a medium biomass, 3.5, and and you're going to apply between 50 and 60 pounds, and low, you know, somewhere between 70 and 80. So, you know, I guess the, the question I've got is, you know, is, is this intensive wheat management approach relevant for organic wheat? I think it is, um, you know, with, with maybe some minor modifications. Um, and this is not, this isn't something we've, we've tested uh, rigorously, and I think it, it needs to be, but I think it's a good starting place. So, while it may not be realistic to split applications with organic materials, I think in certain situations you, you could justify it. If you're not, I think the most important thing you need to look at is the, the tissue test of gross base curve. And then you apply your materials based on, on the kind of available nitrogen. However, when you go out there at growth stage 25, right at spring green up and you've got really low fluid density, maybe we ought to think about putting it down a little bit soon. It's critical that we use a, a quick source of available nitrogen. Compost isn't going to work. And of course, since raw manures have to be incorporated, that's not going to work as a top press. So we're limited to things like your pelletized poultry litter, which has been pasteurized, some of the blended fertilizers, feather meal, you can figure out a way to spread it, uh, chelated nitrate, and national organic standards require that you can't apply in excess of 20% of the nitrogen need, so we're limited to between 20 and 30 pounds of uh, nitrate from chelated in, depending on what you decide the, the needs are. And here I think it's important to consider both the cost and its handling characteristics, particularly for feather. Can I ask about compost? Yeah. Do you think compost is going to slow the leaks? Can I figure out if I qualify compost for the unavailable Well, let's, so let's let's figure that you've been organic for a while, you've built up your, your organic matter, and we're getting, you know, we can give you a credit because of historic use of uh, you know, 40 or 50 pounds of, of available nitrogen that you're going to get from the soil. You still need you know, another 50 to 60 pounds of available nitrogen. Sit down and pencil out how much compost you have to apply to get 50 to 60 pounds of available nitrogen and figure out if you can profitably grow wheat from that. We're, we're talking about you know, 30 to 40 tons on a driveway basis. So yes, you can do it. I don't think you can make it. Yeah, that's no, that's what I'm thinking. Because it won't be. I don't know. No, I would be. It would be. I think. Yeah, I think that you know it, it would work much better to you know if we could make it work economically. I think it would work much better than applying you know culture in the fall because most of that nitrogen is going to be mineralized pretty quickly. Sorry. Most of the nitrogen from culture litter is going to be mineralized pretty quickly compared to compost. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, because it's uh, you can't, you have to incorporate it. The, the rules state that you know, if it's raw manure, it's got to be incorporated for, for food crops that don't contact the ground at least 90 days before harvest. Yeah, well, 120 if it comes into contact with the soil. I agree. You can't incorporate it if you're top dressing it. So. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk just a little bit about bread wheat, and then uh, time we got. Hopefully, we can open up some questions. We have got a couple more slides in there. So, the Christmas procedure discussed the, the baking quality 
tends to increase with, with increasing vertical contact. And for the most part, we're looking for anything, you know, at least 12 12 percent. We're looking for higher if we can get. The thing we need to keep in mind is that protein and starch content are inversely proportional. So environments that favor high yields, such as we have in the east, we've got a humid, humid climate, plenty of rainfall, tend to favor low protein. It's just protein pollution. And the, the, the reverse is true. That's why we can grow high protein wheat westward. We've got limited rainfall. So one approach that's been adopted to, to overcome this is you know, we, we do that intensive wheat management early in the season, build good yields, and then come in just as that, just really late food, and put on 20 to 30 pounds of, of, uh, of nitrogen, and the conventional systems they're using low biurate urea in a solution to spray it right on. They can see anywhere from a half to to a full point and a half increase in protein. In organic systems, you know, this is where we really need to go with the, the rapidly available end sources. It needs to be available really quick. You need the paints to take it up and, and dump it right into the drain. So we're looking at, we get Chilean nitrate or, or feather meal. The reason feather meal will work here is because it, it mineralizes really rapidly. Of course, uh, you know, you'll also hear that sulfur fertility is also critical. But in an organic system where we've got a history of either potassium sulfate or animal manure use, then sulfur is generally going to be adequate. <clears throat> Ellen Mallory and Heather Darby, Ellen's at University of Maine, and Heather is uh, University of Vermont recently did some work looking at top dressing for organic, uh, organic wheat production. They had uh, four site years in this data. They looked at three top dress treatments. No top dress, top dress with Chilean nitrate, and top dress with pelletized poultry litter. And the, the, the no top dress received either no manure or manure applied pre-plant at about 65 pounds of plant available in per acre. Top dress treatments, all of these received uh, fall nitrogen from that manure. And then it was either applied at tiller, at flag leaf, or at late food. What they saw was that with the Chilean nitrate, they saw a small increase in yield when it was applied at flag leaf or later. But they didn't see a yield increase with the, the pelletized culture later. Now, part of that is that. The Chilean nitrate was only applied about 20 pounds per acre, not much. And because they wanted to make a comparison between Chilean nitrate and pelletized poultry litter, this was also only applied at approximately, at approximately 20 pounds of plant available nitrogen per acre, so a pretty low rate. Um, what they were really going for here is not just the yield increase, by the way, sorry about the units, 4,000 kilograms per hectare is equal to about 60 bushels, which apparently in, in uh, Maine and Vermont is, is reasonably good. Um, what they were really looking for was a, a protein increase. So they also looked at protein. <clears throat> and what they found was that even where they didn't see a yield response, they still got a, a protein increase with Chilean nitrate, tillering, flag leaf, and food. They only saw the, the increase in protein content with the pelletized poultry litter and the flag leaf and food, and not nearly as much as they saw with Chilean nitrate. Again, I think that's, that's more a matter of just not getting enough down because and then what they, the other interesting thing that they saw is that the later they applied it, the higher the, the higher the increase in protein. And that's what we see in conventional systems. And it's again, it's because it's, you know, the wheat plants are taking that late available nitrogen and sticking it right into the grain. Um, the other comment, I think this is a really important one when we think about these things as a, as a system. You've got to consider all the factors. If we're trying to manage this, uh, this wheat to get the protein premiums, you know, fertility is only one part of it. We only got this up to 10%. This is a hard way where we, uh, the variety I think was a, I think it's a harbor is the name of the variety. And, and they also did some, some variety trials at the same time. And it turned out to be one of the, the lowest scoring in terms of protein content of all the varieties they looked at. So we just didn't have the genetic potential to get it there. You know, if, if, if this were, you know, somewhere around 11 and bump it up and get it over 12, you know, it would work. But you know, 
this be the baseline? I mean, even with this intensive fertility management, it just didn't get us there. I think that's the last slide I have. It is. I hope uh, you guys have some really good questions for a discussion.